Welcome to Handstamp. My name is Josh Coyne and I'm here to explore the live music experience and the memories that come with it. I'm delighted to be back for yet another episode uh, with another amazing guest. I'm joined by British actor, writer, comedian and musician Matthew Bainton, who you may recognise from BBC's Ghosts, Horrible Histories, Hulu's The Wrong Man's and legendary sitcom Peep Show. Matthew, where are you joining me from today? Uh, from, from home. Bit of laundry in the background. Uh, yeah, Some you know, everyone's character. at home, right? Exactly. How, how are you coping with the madness of it all? I'm good, yeah. I'm just... Any time I talk about it, all, all I can really think is just I'm extraordinarily lucky. It, mm-hmm. it feels like any kind of minor gripe I might have about finding it, you know, during lockdown, I was trying to homeschool and that was difficult. But like, I, I, I'm really lucky. We've got a house and a garden and we're, we're well off. And yeah, no genuine suffering where yeah. like there's so much genuinely awful stuff that people are facing so yeah and we were lucky as well because we finished filming ghosts just before lockdown and we'd already had the next one commissioned so i also had work to carry on with whereas like most of my industry uh, lots of people just are waiting until things start up again before they get any uh, any income again. This is a jolly way to start. <laughs> <laughs> We've gone right into the deep end. But um, congratulations, by the way, you mentioned Ghosts. Um, amazing, tremendous new series. Um, how has it been having it out in the world? Oh, it's great. It's, yeah, it's been lovely. And uh, we have such lovely kind of like vocal fans who talk to us on Twitter and to each other and sort of, really invest in every kind of detail of the characters and so it's that's really lovely we get I think uh, you know I'm old enough to remember a kind of pre-social media time in television where you put something out and you hoped people liked it and you you got told about viewing figures and stuff but you didn't necessarily Mm. have any relationship with your audience or you couldn't tell if that two million people were sat on the edge of their seat loving it or if two million people were making tea while it was on in the background so um that's one of the few really positive things about twitter for me is being able to sort of see that it's going down really well and yeah it's lovely so you have enjoyed quite um quite a large degree of engagement with fans and being able to see some real positivity about the latest yeah series. man they're, they're properly like they they love it and they they do art like fan art and stuff and so yeah we and we've got a whatsapp group between us and we sort of share our favorite bits of uh fan art and stuff with each other and yeah like someone the other day had knitted li- little knitted versions of the characters and stuff is yeah it's great it's certainly something that people really attach themselves isn't it especially i guess over here in britain there's a kind of sitcom cult you know as soon as someone really likes a sitcom they live their life by that sitcom and they stand (laughs) by it i mean even if you if you consider um another tom kingsley show that staff lets flats also has a very similar kind of cult following that will create fan art and fan fiction and all sorts i think it's because people define themselves by their sense of humor like it's something you would put on a dating thing Mm. that you have a sense of humor or like that it's important to you that you have the same True. sense of humor as someone and it bonds friendships and it, you know no one has a sense of drama where they're like i couldn't be friends with you if you liked different drama to me <laughs> but sense of humor is a really defining thing for people so yeah and i was that i was definitely that growing up it meant i really defined myself by by comedies that I watched and yeah I remember like Father Ted when when I got into that I was probably 14 or something like that and it was a real it went hand in hand with getting into my own music that wasn't what my dad listened to Mm -hmm. was like finding my own sitcom that my parents hadn't seen and talking to my friends about it and sort of having that shared language of like quoting bits of it and yeah it's 
it's a really p- people hold it very close father ted another show that actually used music and referenced music quite subtly but quite regularly right. yeah lot, and, and what what an unbelievable theme tune oh my god i mean yeah neil hannon is just, i was thinking about there was a lot of stuff on twitter because divine comedy just did a show right last uh mm-hmm. last night i think and i was reflecting on divine comedy and his work and uh there was a, an album of his, a short album about love that was a like quite a big part of uh, of one of my closest uh, friendships at school, someone who's sadly no longer around. And uh, it kind of suddenly, just seeing Divine Comedy popping up in people's timeline kind of suddenly took me back to that album and that place. I was like, I've got, I've got to listen to that album start to finish again sometime soon. I haven't listened to it for years. Excellent. Yeah. So, I mean, the way you mentioned how sitcoms can, and, you know, people's sense of humor can start to define who they are. I also think that to a certain degree, it kind of creates people's, it really strongly influences people's lexicon. I know there's a whole generation that essentially started to re- react to things in the same way that Tim does in the office. You know, that, that, right. became, yeah, yeah, that yeah. became a thing. People started to talk like they were in the show, the office. And I think yeah. that, a large part of music's influence is that during your formative years, that becomes a real strong part of your identity. Was that the case for you? Was it, um, what was it that you kind of, that stuck with you and kind of maybe informed the way you presented yourself growing up? God, that's a really, it's a really difficult question to answer because I I definitely sort of had, I mean, I just, I, I, music is really my first love I would say and I fell deep and hard and I still feel the same way now that I did when I was sort of 12 13 when I first realized that I could go into record shops and just like look through the covers and and put something on a listening post or or just buy it because it looked interesting and then there's sort of endless possibility of it and I still really get off on finding new music and I, I kind of noticed that a lot of people hit a certain point in adulthood where they kind of go back to the music that defined them when they were kind of teenagers and go actually I'm not I'm done searching because that was the best because it was when I felt it the most so I'm just going to listen to the Stone Roses from now on mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> and I just think and, and you hear a lot of people talk about how music isn't as good as it used to be or whatever and you just think well no you just you just aren't trying as hard Mm. because there's always amazing stuff going on yeah now now is now more than ever it's just like there's an endless well just yeah it just it it, the search is like is is never over and it's just and you still can be so rewarded by discovering like new things so I don't know, like I definitely went through phases and I probably had like any sort of teenager, a slight snobbery about like choosing, mm. you know, choosing not to like something if I, if I figured it had become too mainstream or like claiming to, to only like the early work of Pavement when in fact Terror Twilight was my favorite Pavement <laughs> record, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, and sort of... I guess, yeah, I guess for me, I just, I I still feel the same way and I still kind of, I've never settled on like a genre or a subculture even. I like kind of all sorts and uh, I've even forgotten the question. (laughs) Essentially kind of what um, shaped your passion for music and and actually yeah. maybe maybe we'll shape the question slightly differently and ask kind of you be, eventually i mentioned before that you're a musician as well was there anything kind of in your um early music loving years that maybe influenced you to pick up an instrument well the honest answer i think is that is actually my my eldest brother i've got two older brothers my eldest brother's four years older than me and I guess I was 11 or 12 when he joined a band and started playing bass for this band. And uh, 
they practiced in my mum and dad's garage and I sort of to his annoyance I I walked into the garage while they were mid practice and they were like mid song so he couldn't tell me to piss off and watch them practice and it was a, a genuinely kind of hallelujah moment of going oh they're just they're just dudes who live around here and they're a band Mm -hmm. that means i could be Mm -hmm. i mean i don't play an instrument yet but i can work on that you know and he had a he had like a three-quarter size nylon string guitar that i don't know if he'd borrowed from school or or what but he never really touched it so i just picked it up and started sort of teaching myself and in fact, the guitarist in that, in that band was where, and on that day was wearing a Lemonheads t-shirt. Right. And I'd never heard that band. And he just looked cool with his guitar, which was like a, like a Gibson copy, like an Epiphone. And he had cool, like, he just looked cool. Mm-hmm. And in his Lemonheads t-shirt. And so that was the first time I was like, I think it was the first album I bought with my own pocket money was Come On, Feel the Lemonheads. And it was purely because that dude looked cool wearing his Lemonheads t-shirt. And then, but then I just instantly loved that record too. And so that, yeah, that was probably my, that was probably the moment I opened the door and stepped into a kind of lifelong obsession and passion for music. And it was both, about discovering new music and also about the idea of like making music myself. And uh, yeah, I spent my whole teenage years just like me and my friend Ed, just, we got a, we got a four track tape recorder and we just spent all of our time outside of school, sat in each other's bedrooms, just recording ripoffs basically, just like imitating Blur or the Charlatans or whatever we were listening to. And then like pretending to be radio DJs interviewing, <laughs> interviewing us as if we were this successful band. You know? Yeah, that's essentially what I'm doing now, Matthew, to be honest. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so it's amazing, really, the power of a, of a good T-shirt and a good haircut, really, isn't it? I really? mean, Sticking your absolutely. head in your by association, I need to listen to the Lemonheads. Right, 100%. It could have been anything else. Mm-hmm. And uh, oh, yeah, I mean, like... I didn't get I didn't get into Nirvana until much much later or the like really at the time the grunge scene was kind of at its peak but I didn't experience any of that until later yeah uh sort of retrospectively because it just so happened it was Lemonheads and it was that sort of I guess more more poppy really Mm -hmm. indie that was my that was my first sort of yeah entry point into music so then i guess naturally at one point growing up in south end am i am i correct yeah. so so what were your options when you did make that decision where you wanted to start to go to see live music what were your options in south end i was pretty lucky actually because south end is like it, it felt growing up like i was growing up in a small town because you you knew that Lon- london was like a train ride away and that was where it was all happening but I think a bit later in life, I realized that it's a massive town and big enough to have its own counterculture and to have its own sort of music scene and live venues where people did come and play. There was a venue called Chinneries, which I mean, like Pearl Jam came and played there, I think, in, ah. you know, and um, like, and there was the Cliffs Pavilion where Blur played and Oasis and like some of the, some of the kind of big bands would come and play there. Um, but like, crucially for me, it was small enough that when I started a band, it didn't feel unrealistic to, to sort of be in that, be in a scene myself. Mm -hmm. Whereas I kind of think if, if you grow up in London, it's a, you've got to have a bit more swagger to sort of think, oh yeah, I could, I could be in a band and play because like London is full of, full of really brilliant, successful people. Whereas in South End, it felt like there weren't that many people doing it. So you could, you could sort of hope at least to make some kind of impact. Yeah. And, and you mentioned how Pearl Jam played that venue and in South End. And that, that's 
almost becomes a beacon of hope if you think, yeah, okay, yeah, so yeah. the first step is maybe I'll be able to play on that stage and I've at least got something in common with these huge bands at one point. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because we did like Battle of the Bands on that stage and it was exactly that feeling was like, man, there's some like really proper people have stood on this stage and plugged their guitar in and played to people and now I'm doing it. Yeah, I, I remember going to maybe our first show. So I'm, I'm from just outside Leicester. Right. And I remember going to the Charlotte in Leicester and seeing the posters. I mean, they could have put anyone up and I would have believed it at this point, but they had kind of Red Hot Chili Peppers, Coldplay, Pearl Jam, all mm. these bands that had once been on that stage. And I remember it being like, a, well, for this next 48 hours, my belief is going to be that I've completed life. That's yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. It's amazing. So what was your first live show? That I ever went to. Yeah. I, again, I think it was the Lemonheads. <laughs> this is becoming a Lemonheads uh, podcast. It, it was my, my brother had gone to uni at this point, same one. He'd gone to Bristol University. So he's now 18 or 19. And I'm now like 14 or 15. I guess it must have been when Car Button Cloth came out, which is like, I, I think one of the, it was the last Lemonheads album for a long time anyway. Um, and he said that I could bring my then girlfriend and friend uh, to, and sleep on the floor in his student accommodation and come to the show at, at Brist, at the, like it was at the student union. Um, so yeah, we got the train, like the whole thing felt like, an, like a proper kind of adult adventure where, at a time when like I didn't I was a 14 year old who looked 14 in fact probably 12 so mm -hmm. the whole thing was like we're going on a train all the way to Bristol and we're gonna try and get served or at least my brother will get us some drinks and like mm -hmm. there was the the sort of feeling of adrenaline of will the bouncers even let us in are you allowed to come to this gig if you're under 18 but we've got tickets so surely they'll let you know mm -hmm. and um I don't remember all that much of the show, except that I'm pretty sure that Evan Dando had like a whole bottle of whiskey that he came onto stage with and that he had finished by the time he ended the set. And I'm pretty sure there was a, a section where he sort of plugged in a little kind of Casio keyboard into all his guitar pedals and just sort of spent a bit too long <laughs> enjoying making you know, just kind of like feedback loops and stuff. So nice, slightly indulgent part of the show. Yeah, it? which I mean, like I've now, I've since, there are, there are far more avant-garde shows that I've been to and really enjoyed. But at the time I was, I was very much like play confetti, play, you know, play the hits. Yeah. Um, but I was just, you know, it was just kind of incredible to be in an adult space and seeing someone who I kind of had idolized whether or not I still wholly did I don't know but yeah uh, a friend of mine I, I, you just made me think when you mentioned about going to slightly more avant-garde shows a friend of mine recently told me that they went on a first date from someone that they'd met on tinder um, and they didn't really discuss their music taste before this. So he, he went fully into the deep end and he said, well, I'm actually thinking of going to this show. Do you want to come with me? And he'd heard a couple of songs on the, on six music or something and really liked them. Um, but there was a reason those were the songs on the radio because the others were like very right. much album tracks, but it got to the point halfway through the date where the band had a, I think 10 minute section where it was just a, one of those woodpecker metronomes um, <laughs> for percussion. And then they were doing like spoken word poetry over it. Now, if that isn't going to test the date yeah, experience, yeah. then I don't know what is. My first um, post lockdown gig, which was last week, was an artist called David Thomas Broughton. Do you, do you know him? I don't know. And he's like, it, it was his live performances are just like it's a cliche to say that someone is unique or like 
no one else sounds like them, but there is no absolutely no one like this guy. Okay. And he does like, he plays, he can play beautifully and craft these really achingly sad kind of melancholic songs with an acoustic guitar and his voice is, is really kind of um, has this like rich and like painful tone, but his, his live performances, it's, it's like watching someone begin to craft something beautiful and then get out a hammer and smash it up in front of you. Right. He has this like desire to destroy the nice thing that he's making and he'll do things like he'll, he'll, he'll pull the string out of a rape alarm and have that Jeez. throughout the set just going, woo, woo, woo. And, and as he did the other night, and this halfway through the set, he asked if anyone had any requests. The other thing about this guy is he's really funny. Like the yeah. other thing, he would, there's almost like a clownish, it's almost like he's sending up the very idea of someone standing up and performing songs to you. And he, he's re- genuinely really funny. Um, but yeah, halfway through the set, he said, has anyone got any requests? And this guy who clearly like he'd maybe listened to some of the recorded music, but was unaware that this was what the live show was going to be like, because I've seen him a bunch of times and most of the audience know what they're in for and they're down with it. But this guy just shouted, turn the fucking beep off. <laughs> and he was, he just leaned into the microphone and went, well, that's the best bit. <laughs> that's Actually, extraordinary. It was extraordinary. But yeah, I kind of, it's hard to make him sound like something that you should go and see because there is an element of like, you're almost locking yourself in a room with an abuser somehow. But I, I was just so... thinking, I'm going to need to do my own research because you You've done a good job at trying to sell it, but it just isn't an easy sell, is it? There's a really good documentary film about him called The Ambiguity of David Thomas Broughton. Okay. Which, if you can find that, it it does a pretty good job of sort of, of, of illustrating what and who he is. I absolutely love him. Um, Mm. But yeah, it's like it's a particular ride that you're strapping in for when you go and see him live. So the biggest kind of breaking news in what you said there was that you saw a live show recently. So what was yeah, the, man. what was the setup and how did you find it? It was the, it was at the Clapham Grand, which I'd not been to before. And it, um, grand is a good word, you know, it's like a big old theater space. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess big enough that they could do like a socially distanced seating thing. So it, there were seats like, and you were seated in, in pairs and you couldn't go to the bar yourself. You had to get someone's attention to get you a drink. Right. And there was like a one way system to walk around if you got up. Um, it wasn't ideal. And I think he probably found it, even a performer like him, who's, whose act is kind of pretty confrontational and strange. Um, I felt like he seemed a little bit, even he seemed a little bit marooned by that sense of distance from the crowd. I mean, he usually comes or often comes into the crowd and kind of does stuff amongst people as well, which he obviously couldn't do. Um, and yeah, I, like, I think the Clapham Grand's doing as much comedy as it is um, music in, in this way. And I was thinking, wow, that would be a weird stand-up crowd. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I'm in two minds about it because like, one of the things I hate increasingly about gigs is just being like packed in like sardines and i probably if you'd asked me 20 years ago never would have thought i'd say this but i love a seated gig now Mm -hmm. love it i know it was a real moment of my life it felt like a turning point where i was at a festival a couple of maybe i guess two almost two yeah two years ago i guess at end of the road festival and we had our camping chairs and we walked our way to the main stage with the camping chairs for the first time in my life we took the chairs for the day mate and you, i loved it that's just you're just winning you're just prepared and you know you know you need it mm-hmm. when you're younger i guess you just well a you're just your body doesn't 
sort of make you make a noise when you sit down. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess you don't crave that kind of constant energy. Yeah, sort of thing. yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, we had tickets for End of the Road this year. It was going to be our first. We've got two kids and um, we've been like talking. We, we have the conversation every year when the festival lineups come out and stuff. We're like do you think they're old enough now that we could like do it and still enjoy it and get to see music? Because lots of our friends who take kids to festivals are like, yeah, you don't really, you're not really able to see the music, but you're just there in the festival and Mm -hmm. you can take your kids to the kids field and stuff. And we're like, I I don't go to a festival because I want to put wellies on and trudge around for a weekend. I go for the music. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were gutted because my son had really got into some of the bands on the lineup and he's nine and he'd like, we had this really enjoyable experience together where we were putting together a playlist and like Googling every band on the lineup and deciding who he liked and who he didn't and who he'd want to see. And we were making this playlist for his MP3 player and he was really excited about seeing a bunch of these bands and then it was like, nah. It's not happening. Yeah, I remember. I remember the anticipation ahead of it being cancelled, and it, it, it's quite naive now looking back at it. But you're thinking, well, it is the last one of the season, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. so you think maybe exactly. we've got a chance. And now, at this point, I am extremely worried that 2021 won't happen because of how. Yeah, it. exactly. Now it's like we're thinking in years, and yeah. at the time, everyone was going, maybe there'll be a vaccine by then. What? No, no. <laughs> but safety first. <clears throat> fingers yeah crossed. yeah um, yeah and we'll see what happens um was there a moment when um maybe i mean obviously you continue to perform music but was there mm. a point where you thought you know you said that you were a music fan first but at what point did you say okay so maybe comedy live comedy uh on-screen comedy is a route for you uh, yeah i don't know i think i think partly it's because um music felt completely self-taught and a hobby and like I I didn't even do music at GCSE and I still can't read notation and stuff so I never had a I never had a feeling that I needed to study it so I went to drama school because that was also something I enjoyed which felt like something I could pursue in higher education and and I loved it but um but I was still playing in my band and I was still sort of hoping that things would happen. Um, and really, I guess, I guess it was when I started to actually have a career as a performer that any sense of, am I making a choice here ever really came into it? Cause until then I was just like, well, I, I just do both. And mm-hmm. there's people, there's, there are superhuman people like Donald Glover who absolutely can just do both. He comes up really regularly in these conversations. Does he? (laughs) So so many artists are just thinking, "Yeah, man, how has this guy got everything?" It's infuriating. It's it's uh, yeah, it's not fair. But um, there were a couple of slight like watershed moments. um, One of which was like was not my own stuff actually, but I'd been playing on and off with a friend of mine called Rob Smelton, who um, he plays in Hot Chip, and he has his he had his own act called Grosvenor and, and um, I played in his live band for that. And we toured supporting hot chip and um, like by then I sort of was well in, I, I was well into my TV career and it felt like a kind of a lovely gift of just getting to briefly experience the original dream I'd had, mm-hmm. but to be able to enjoy it with no, pressure or no worry about this being my income or you know I kind of realized that I got a pretty good deal in the end and that the album and touring cycle for me at this point in my life would just feel absolutely punishing and um and really high pressure because you've got to just keep doing it um so yeah that he that friend rob started another band a while ago called black peaches and he asked me if i wanted to be part of it and i did a couple of sessions with him and then sort of realized that i was never going to be able to commit to dates like 
in advance for him and had to just call him and say, look, I, th- I think for your sake, I just shouldn't be part of this because right. every, you know, every time you book a tour, I might be going, Oh, sorry, man, I'm shooting. Mm-hmm. So, um, I guess if there's ever been a moment where I've like had to make a choice, it was that, but other than that, I think the choice was made for me by the fact that the music wasn't successful particularly and the comedy was. <laughs> so, but but uh, also yeah. as a, as, as a byproduct of that, you, you know, there's, there's no coincidence that you have also incorporated, incorporated a lot of music performance into your on-screen work. Yeah, it definitely, I mean, initially I felt like all the parts I got at the beginning of my career or the vast majority of them came about because I could play. I think like one of my first jobs was in a film called Telstar and I was playing a, a young Richie Blackmore. And, you know, when you're auditioning for young actors who can play the guitar, you've already narrowed it down mm-hmm. quite a lot. So from my point of view, it probably meant there was a bit less competition for some of those parts. And like I played a drummer in an indie band in a film around the same time. And yeah, I think early on, it was like a really useful extra skill. Um, and yeah, I've, I've kind of found ways to use music as well in things that I've done. Yeah. And there are two questions that I go to regularly with our guests. Um, I go, well, actually, maybe three. I always go for first show. We've covered that. What about your favorite show ever? Can you pinpoint something that you that really stands out? It's so this is so hard because I it genuinely going to see gigs is probably well just is the my most regular kind of social life thing. Uh I so it, the context for that is that I met my girlfriend when I was 19. And we've been together ever since. And the first thing we bonded over was music um, and a discovery that we'd been at a bunch of live shows when we hadn't before we'd met. Like, and Hefner was one of the big ones that we yeah. were both really into at the time. And we'd been, we realized we'd been at like three or four gigs and not met each other until then. Um, and so we, would, we just went to gigs all the time. And... Um, we like moved to London together. I didn't really hang out all that much with other drama school guys because they were all sort of singing show tunes around the piano and it wasn't my scene. So it, we really became like these antisocial couple <laughs> <laughs> who all we just did was just go to gigs together. So there are just so many uh, that it's really hard to pick one. Uh, but I'll just list a, I'll list a ton of them. Why not? List them. Kate Bush, when she did her run, was extraordinary. And we took my girlfriend's mum, who had always been a huge Kate Bush fan, and there was something really special about that show for so many reasons. Um, Joanna Newsom at the Barbican, I'll never forget, was just like no one mind, mind blowing. No one uh, else in the world that's similar to... Jesus. Oh, just, yeah. And just so, I mean, no kind of limit to her songwriting brilliance. Um, uh, Neutral Milk Hotel playing in the aeroplane over the sea because that had become, you know, it is a real cult album. I got into it when I was like... 17 or something and it felt it almost felt like the band and and the songwriter didn't exist that the the whole thing was some sort of myth Mm -hmm. and felt extremely kind of i felt like i had an extremely intimate and personal relationship with it so then when they announced that they were going to tour and play that album i kind of couldn't believe that they were even real people right so that whole kind of show felt like I was dreaming it almost. Yeah, and just to clarify, um, that's the name of the album that they were playing. That wasn't the venue. Yeah, yeah. An airplane yeah. over the sea. That's right, yeah. And it was at the Roundhouse, I think. Um, but also, I've, I, I love when you get to see someone playing before they go 
big and I have really fond memories of some of those where like we saw we saw bright eyes in I think the year 2000 in a little pub in King's Cross and it was fevers and mirrors had come out um and we were just intensely in love with that album um and you know it was it was just a pub it was like I'd played bigger venues yeah but the people that were there felt like they all had this we all had this secret like we'd found this guy and we were here and you know it was such a small and dingy venue venue I remember him going to the to the gents after the set you know and no one harassing him or trying to bother him it was just like that's how small and low-key it was at that point so end of the road really would have been a nice um uh full circle moment. yeah 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 to see him again because I, I i don't think no we did yeah we did see him a couple of times after that another one that 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 stands out was um uh ardem from uh fridge used to put on shows and he did one year he did this festival called home fires and um Joanna Newsom played at that as well, which was amazing. It was, a, it was at Conway Hall, uh, which is a little, almost like community space in Hoburn. And um, Bill Callahan played just solo with, with an acoustic guitar, and he played songs from the as yet unreleased album, A River Ain't Too Much to Love. And it's rare when you see people just just play a whole bunch of new material that you love it straight away. And that was one of those occasions where every single note and sort of every single moment of that set, I was just like, oh my God, this is a masterpiece. He's written a masterpiece and I'm hearing it before it comes out. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, and, and it absolutely, I think, is a masterpiece Incredible. of an album. Incredible. Um, yeah, there's, there, are, there are so many. I genuinely, I could go on and on. DM Stith is another, we saw, that was my last gig before lockdown. We're seeing him at King's Place. And he, if you've never heard him, is just, again, is just so unique and extraordinary. And um, yeah, I wish I could like distill one, but I genuinely, I honestly feel like every year of my life, I have a gig that is the gig. It's, it's, and, uh, it's like being asked to choose your favorite child. Yeah, 100%. I was really hoping you were going to say uh, DMX was one of you. That would, have re- been, that would have been a real spanner in the world. Yeah. yeah. Um, what about live recordings? Um, are you a fan of them in general, maybe like live albums or DVDs? And are there any live recordings that you've just gone back to consistently? That's a good question too. Uh, yeah, there definitely are. I mean, I the, the Bill Withers live at Carnegie Hall is amazing. I think partly because of him talking in between songs as well that, you get a real sense of him as a person and you, you sort of feel like there's an intimacy to that. Um, uh, there's well live at Shanae, the Jeff Buckley EP, I think it's sort of a rare example of, of something which is not a record, you know, just being played live. It's sort of the performance feels like it's a one-off. Yeah. Um, and it and that it's just been it was just lucky it got captured um there's also his dad tim buckley there's a double album called dream letter i think which is which was recorded at the royal festival hall which is amazing um and then another one i don't know if it's an album but it, but there's certainly you can watch it all is um bjork at the Royal Opera House um, when she was touring Vespertine, which is the, I think of all the shows in my life that I wish I had gone to, that would be my, like my greatest regret would be not hunting down or I think I, I think it's not that I didn't hunt them down, but that I balked at how much they were. Mm -hmm. Um, I've done that a few times. But man, I wish I'd been there. That, 
that album is so special and her performance is just incredible. Yeah. So would that, would that be the biggest uh, n- no-go regret that you've had then, the, the not going to that Bjork show? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I've, got, I've got a few of them. I turned down watching uh, Brian Wilson play Pet Sounds. Oh, um, oh, that's a contender for, for, for best gig as well. Not Pet Sounds, but I went to see him do Smile right. um, with my dad. And that was just amazing. Oh, another one is Elliot Smith. I saw Elliot Smith. At, it was either Queen Elizabeth Hall or Royal Festival Hall. And um, that was that was just a hell of a show and everyone everyone by the end had just got out of their seats and gone down to the front to the sort of there was like a a moment of well if we all do it then they can't stop us yeah um which sort of sticks in my mind i've never heard any elliot smith live um i can't imagine him without the kind of um the double track vocals double track vocals and yeah it, yeah it's true i think i mean that that was when he was touring um XO no yeah no figure of eight so so he was he was playing sort of a lot of material off that album with a band and but but actually the most special part of it was the encore when it was just him and he did like um between the bars and pizzola and that was when it felt I mean I think that that's the Elliot Smith I love the most is is Mm -hmm. the one where you feel like that he's whispering almost you know he's recording in an apartment or something mm-hmm. i mean whether or not he did i don't know but like you feel like he's trying not to disturb the neighbors so he's just right in close to the microphone and you feel <laughs> like, um so that's i guess the closest it got to that i guess we're, we're seeing an influx of artists that are being kind of really directly uh, influenced by Elliot Smith, we're getting a lot of Phoebe Bridges content, and Phoebe Bridges mm. endlessly says that she's Elliot Smith influenced. Uh, the new Fleet Foxes album, Elliot Smith all over it. He, he kind of yeah, talks he references about that. him. Yeah, yeah, he does indeed. And uh, that's that's when you know that in the people that you've seen, you've seen quite you know quite the collection of influential musicians. It sounds like. yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember he, finding out that he had died, and I was. I was doing my first professional gig um, as an actor. I'd, it was my first like paid job was up at the Derby Playhouse. Um, and I read the news that he died and it really, it, you know, I cried and I was, it, it was just deeply upsetting. And I felt ridiculous because I felt like I couldn't, say to anyone else in the cast or that I was working with I'm crying because a singer died yeah <laughs> you know oh who's that Elliot Smith and they'd be like oh who who's Elliot Smith <laughs> you know that there'd then just be this whole conversation but yeah I you have that relationship with there's certain there's certain um songwriters who I feel like you've they just affect you in that way, you know, that it feels really personal if you lose them. And speaking of special songwriters, special songs, influential songs, I would be remiss, Matthew, if I didn't. And I'd probably get asked to leave the house if I didn't ask you if you could remember any of the lyrics of Charles II, King of the... <laughs> I think I probably... I think I can probably remember them all start to finish. Can you, you don't um, need to wrap it, but can you give me a few bars? I love the people and the people love me so much that they restored the English monarchy. I'm part Scottish, French, Italian, a little bit Dane, but 100% party animal. Champagne. I mean, I genuinely, I could go start to finish. We, we, had to, we did a prom uh, where we performed a bunch of those songs and... Yeah, there's nothing like knowing you're going to play the Albert Hall. Again, that's a, I'd seen people I love on that stage, like Bell and Sebastian, and was like, oh, now I'm on it. Um, but yeah, there's no way any of those lyrics will ever leave my head because we were so nervous that we just were never going to not learn them. Yeah, well, exactly. Another example of you being actor, any kind of performer and musician. Yeah. 
and that's a true music lover. Matthew, it's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, Thank man. Thank you very I, much for joining me. I could talk all day. It's been so fun. Thanks, man. Thanks, mate.